Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Susanna Morrison-Mitchell, a Senior Research Fellow at LNAP. I'll be the moderator for today's event. While we're waiting for more people to join and as people keep trickling in, I'm gonna ask a few questions just to get a sense of who is in the room today. To do this, we will be using Mentimeter. To use Mentimeter, there is a link in the chat, or you can go to menti.com and then enter the number that you see on the screen. Enter the number 31431246. So once again, to answer our icebreaker questions, if you can please go to menti.com and enter the number on your screen now. Okay, I see some of you have already made it to Menti and to the first question. So if you have Menti opened, you can have it either open on your computer or on your phone. Um, what this allows us to do is to get you to respond to questions live during the session. So the first question, which we can see people already answering, is what is your level of experience with evaluation? I'm gonna give everyone a few more minutes to get on menti.com while people are trickling in. So once again, if you're just joining us now, um, then you can use go to menti.com and use the code 31431246. Now we are on Zoom webinar today, so you will not be able to see the other participants, um, but we will be going later to breakout sessions in which you will be able to see the other participants and to interact with them. I'm just going to give everyone another minute to go to menti.com. If you can please uh, answer our first question on what is your level of experience with evaluation. Um, okay, so we're starting to see the numbers come in as more people are joining. Um, it looks like quite a few of you have six to 10 years of experience. We have some people who have over 15 years and quite a few people who are within the first five years of their evaluation experience. And I should say, I mean evaluation either in terms of being an evaluator or a commissioner of evaluations or a user of evaluations. Okay, let's go to our next Mentimeter question, our next icebreaker. So the next question is how often do you use evaluation guidance? So once again, for those of you just joining, we're having some icebreaker questions. You can go to menti.com and enter the code at the top of the screen. You can do this on your phone or computer. So our second icebreaker question is how often do you use evaluation guidance? I think that there's an assumption that if you're joining the webinar today, you're a user of evaluation guidance or interested. And I think that we can see this reflected as well in the responses here. It looks like the vast majority of you use evaluation guidance on occasion or frequently and very regularly. Fantastic. So we're gonna to go to our last icebreaker question. So our last icebreaker, uh, and this one may be a tough one, but I want you to think of what is the one word that comes to mind when you think about evaluation criteria. So close your eyes and think of one word. What is the first word that comes to your mind when you think about evaluation criteria. Um, so if you can enter your word into the Menti, and once again, for anyone who is joining late, you can go to menti.com and enter the code at the top of the screen in order to see uh, and take the icebreaker questions. Um, okay, we see the words starting to come now. Okay, this is, oh, it's, it's very active and live. The word at the center seems to be structure, effectiveness, uh, guidance, framework. Efficiency, okay, so we have some specific, one person very small, I saw old, <laughs> more of the same, uh, but also meaningful indicators systemic equity, accuracy, OECD DAC, uh, complex triangulation benchmarking. 
Okay, so I think that we'll move on from the icebreaker questions. Um, we get a sense, I suppose, of the immediate associations that people have when we talk about the criteria. So now I'm just going to explain what you can expect from the session today. So first, I will be giving a short presentation on our work to update our guidance on the evaluation criteria. Following that, you will have a chance to exchange with your peers and discuss some of the key issues we are looking at for the guidance update. Finally, we will end by explaining ways for you to stay engaged. I'm just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping first. We're using, we're holding the meeting in Zoom webinar, as I mentioned. We will have breakouts later and those will go to Zoom meeting. You will then be able to unmute yourselves and speak. The chat function is enabled. So please introduce yourself in the chat and where you are from now. Um, as you will have seen, we will be using Mentimeter today to allow for more interaction. To use Mentimeter, you go to the link or to menti.com and you enter the code on the screen. Finally, today's event is being recorded. Now I'm going to hand over to John Mitchell to talk about LNAP's evaluation guidance update and the importance of this work. John is a special advisor at LNAP and previously served as LNAP's director. He is the chair of the advisory group for this project. John, over to you. Thank you, Susanna, and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, as Susanna has alluded to, I have the great privilege of chairing a very experienced advisory group who are guiding our process with great insights and skill. Now, we have quite a large advisory group, 14 people in all, and many of whom are with us here today. Now, to give you a flavour who's on the group, I'd like to briefly introduce you to three advisors who will tell us who they are. They'll share with us why they joined the group and why they believe the revision of the ALNAP guide is so important. So firstly, let's go over to Geneva and talk to Mickey from the IFRC. Mickey, please unmute yourself. Hey, thank you so much, John. Um, and thanks, Susanna, for that introduction to the session. It's really great to be here. My name is Miki Tsukamoto. I'm the coordinator for evaluation. I work at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies um, here in Geneva. So it's quite an honor to be part of um, ALNAP's um, advisory group. I think it's been a great opportunity for the for me and for the IFRC to be able to contribute our experience as well as learn from others on how they're using um, the OCE DAC criteria. Um, I think at the IFRC, we've actually used um, these criteria mainly for our real-time evaluations um, and large evaluations um, for emergency operations, as well as um, we actually refer to them in our evaluation framework. And we will continue to do so um, in the current update we're doing of our framework, because I think we find that these criteria actually for our organization has been helpful um, in terms of um, delivery and design of uh, various evaluative initiatives. Thank you, over. Mickey, thank you so much. Now let's head over to UNICEF. I guess that must be New York City. Michele, please, over to you. Please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, hi, John, hi, Susanna. And, uh, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants to today's webinar. Um, my name is Michele Tarsila. I'm the Chief of Humanitarian Evaluation at the UNICEF Evaluation Office in New York. So I was asked uh, what motivated me to be here today. I guess that as a manager and former practitioner in evaluation, I believe it's our duty and responsibility to uh, be part and also contribute to discussions that are expected to make uh, evaluation a little bit more contemporary and relevant to the work that we do in emergency, especially in the case of UNICEF um, in, the, our effort, in our efforts to serve children and women. And um, I also think that this initiative is quite uh, powerful because it aims to, um, in a democratic way and transparent manner, to push us to think a little bit more through what we normally do sometimes by default in our evaluation practice and through discussion you know, with practitioners, the stepping back will help us to figure out how to better advance the use of criteria, which in the end, when you ask the, you know, somebody on the street, what is the difference between research and evaluation? In most cases, they will tell you it's actually the criteria. So sometimes we just use them by default, you know, in a very uh, a critical manner. So I think a conversation and a webinar like the one today will push us to become a little bit more intentional beyond the so-called evaluation rituals. So thanks again for the opportunity to be part of this. 
Now, Kelly, that's fabulous. Thank you so much. And last but not least, let's go to uh, Henri from the UNHCR. Henri, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so my name is Henry van der Nitzer. I work as a senior evaluation officer. I'm based in Geneva for UNHCR. And um, the, uh, the reason why I joined the advisory group uh, was because I saw it as an opportunity to contribute to something that is very important and relevant, not only for my line of work as an evaluation manager, but also for the evaluation community uh, as a whole. And the reason, I guess, why that's important uh, is in, in, in the second, um, uh, my my second explanation, which is, um, well, you know, whether we like it or not, the OECD DAC criteria have been used um, over the years as sort of the main framework for designing evaluations. And so I feel that we have a responsibility as practitioners to constantly reflect on how we apply them uh, and whether we are doing the right thing in the context of our work. So with that, uh, thank you very much to, uh, to ALNAP also for leading this initiative and for everyone uh, uh, for being here and taking the time. Thanks. Henri, that's great. Thank you so much. So um, why is this initiative so important? Um, well, every year the international humanitarian community spends about $30 billion on global humanitarian operations. In fact, new figures uh, just released maybe yesterday, I believe, uh, sh show that it's now at 45 billion. So that's very interesting. And like every mature profession, substantial resources are committed to identified how well this money has been spent. So after the uh, over the past 20 years, much progress has been made. The quality of evaluation has improved. Evaluative practices are now more deeply embedded in the system. And we have a much fuller picture of where lessons can be learned to improve future response. We've also made significant progress in improving accountability and a substantial number of, eval of evaluations are now in the public domain and can be accessed by anyone with access to the internet. Many are held in ALNAP's help library, which now contains over 20,000 evaluative resources. And the findings from evaluations make a valuable contribution to system-wide monitoring and performance uh, of uh, and reporting on humanitarian performance. The ALNAP State of the System report now provides a robust method for measuring performance over time, and by so doing provides a mirror for the humanitarian community to better understand where humanitarian action is working well, where it's not, and where it needs to improve. And much of this is based upon the data derived from the concepts and metrics that are commonly used to measure humanitarian action. And as we know, these are currently encapsulated in the OECD DAC criteria and guidance, and their interpretation has been successfully provided in the ALNAP 2006 publication, which is widely used and appreciated. Now, all of this sounds very positive, and indeed, I do personally think there's much to celebrate, but at the same time, there's no room for complacency, and it's important to keep challenging ourselves about how to improve, particularly in a rapidly changing world. Which brings me to the aim of this meeting and the revision process itself, which is asking some very fundamental questions. For example, how do we know that we have the right criteria and metrics in place to accurately measure the intended benefits of humanitarian action? Have these gradually become outdated? And are the criteria and metrics still providing us with the most appropriate concepts and ways of thinking that help us define, define quality and performance? Have they kept pace with new ideas and the changing goals of humanitarian action or are they simply providing an old fashioned take on a new and changing world? And fundamentally perhaps, are they capturing not only the technical and mechanistic elements of humanitarianism, uh, important as they are, but also the very spirit of how we understand humanitarianism itself in 2023? Now these issues are really important. They can't be underestimated as they relate to the foundational epistemological base from which we are, <laughs> difficult to say that word, epistemological base from which we understand the successes, failures, and complexities of humanitarian action itself. And in essence, we're asking ourselves, 
whether our current beliefs about the system based upon these common metrics and concepts are truly justified. For me, it's still an open question and one which is at the heart of what we are discussing today. And so with that, uh, I will hand you directly back to Susanna. Susanna, over to you. Great, thank you, John. So LNAP's m and &E guides are some of our most popular publications and have proven to have the longest lifespan. Our principal evaluation guide is our 2016 Evaluation of Humanitarian Action Guide. But we also have specific guides on evaluating protection, real-time evaluations, and obviously the guide on using the OECD DAC criteria. Our guide on using and applying the OECD DAC criteria was published in 2006, 17 years ago. It has stood the test of time surprisingly well, but since then, language and concepts have changed, as have definitions of the criteria, as provided by the OECD DAC. One of the first tasks that I was given when I joined LNAP was to update our guidance on using the criteria. Now, this is not a small undertaking. I knew immediately that if we want the new guide to be applied in practice and adapted to the needs of our members and users, then we would have to involve the wider evaluation community and to design an inclusive process. Moreover, LNAP prides itself on being evidence-based and rigorous. So it seemed obvious to me that we needed to gather evidence about the use of the criteria, both in theory and in practice. Now, the challenge is that most people know and use the criteria in their day-to-day -day work. And oftentimes people have very strong views on them. It was clear that anything that LNAP does, it could generate a lot of debate. As John explained, our first step was to set up an advisory group. We then designed a process to look at the evidence, gather views, and to solicit feedback from intended user, uh, users. Now, let me talk a little bit more around the process. So the first thing that we did then was to commission a literature review, looking not only at the academic literature, but also at other evaluation guidance. So UN, NGO, and IFRC evaluation guides. In addition to this, it was also a review of humanitarian evaluations themselves to see how the criteria are actually used in practice. And we did find a wide gap between the evaluation guidance and evaluation practice when we looked at a sample of humanitarian evaluations. I will be presenting some of the key findings from the review in a minute. But first, I just wanna to go to the next slide to speak briefly about the survey. Today is the launch of our global survey for this project. With the support of the advisory group, we have designed a survey to gather feedback from evaluation practitioners based around the world using the criteria in a variety of contexts. The survey includes questions on key issues that were identified in the review paper for each criterion. There's also open questions in the survey. The survey has both a short option with general questions on the criteria and also a longer option with more technical questions for those wanting to provide additional feedback. The survey is available now in English, so please share it widely with your networks. Versions in Arabic, French, and Spanish are coming soon. We're now going to look at some of the key findings from the review paper. Now, given just how comprehensive the review paper is, which is our most recent research, I'm only going to focus on a small subset of the main issues. The first thing that we looked at is how often are the evaluation criteria being used this is a graph showing how frequently each criterion is used from a review of 120 humanitarian evaluations in LNAP's online help library. As you can see, the vast majority of humanitarian evaluations use the OECD DAC criteria, while some criteria are more commonly used than others, and we'll return to this in a minute. So not only are the OECD DAC criteria widely used in humanitarian evaluations, but they have proven very popular over time. There are a number of reasons that may explain their widespread use. The first one obviously is their simplicity. There's also the fact that practitioners are already trained to use them. 
The criteria also allow evaluators from across the globe to work together by providing a common language. Finally, they help to improve the comparability of evaluation findings from across contexts. Now, of course, the criteria are also not without their critics. There have been criticism that the criteria can't cap cannot capture transformational change or that they are not fully suited to complexity. There have been calls for alternative criteria. There are also concerns that, current, that some of the current criteria do not adequately reflect key norms, values, or specific policy commitments, such as the SDGs or humanitarian commitments on localization or issues such as protection, human rights, gender, and so forth. Finally, there have also been critiques of the criteria related to cultural relevance, including decolonization debates. Some of this is reflected in the Made in Africa evaluation movement, for instance. It may be useful to think about how an LNAP update may be able to partially respond to some of these common complaints about the criteria in recent years. As I said, the paper uh, that we have just published covers each criteria in depth. But today we are going to only focus on six issues. We chose these six issues because they are broader topics that we feel lend themselves well to discussion in this format. Hence, we avoided some of the more technical issues with each of the criteria that are addressed in the survey. So please do take the survey. I'm now going to briefly present the six issues. You will then get to choose one of these issues to discuss with your peers in a breakout group. So while I'm going through this, please think of which one of these six topics you would like to join a breakout group on. So the first option for your breakout is related to the issue of how closely should a revised LNAP guidance be aligned with the revised um, definitions from the OECD DAC. The OECD DAC updated the definitions of the criteria in 2019 and they published their first guidance on the criteria in 2021. Now, LNAP's 2006 guidance predated the OECD guidance. Our guidance was also meant to be used in humanitarian settings. So there was additional criteria added, including coverage, coherence, and connectedness. Now, there's a few other differences as well. But when you look at the definitions, they were always slightly different but they were more or less aligned with the OECD DAC uh, definitions. Hence the question, if you would like to join this breakout group, is should revised LNAP guidance align closely with the criteria? Now, this is related to the question of how important is standardization of having common and standard definitions that everyone across the sector uses versus flexibility. The flexibility to interpret and apply the criteria based on different contexts including specific humanitarian concerns and context. So if you want to join this, this will be the first breakout group. Um, so now we're gonna go back to the Mensimeter very quickly. Um, and so we wanted to get a sense of where people are in the room today. Um, so if anyone just joined, you go to menti.com and you enter the code 31431246. Um, so if you have your Mentimeter open, please, you can start answering this question now. If not, please go to menti.com. So the question that we have, and this is just to get a sense, um, don't think about it too much, is should revised LNAP guidance align closely with the OECD DAC definitions? Um, so if you can vote now, I see some answers are coming in. I'm just going to give everyone another minute. We're not going to spend too much time on this, but what we can see is that it, the response seems to be to some degree. It should be generally aligned similar to now. Um, a few people saying fully aligned, a few people saying no, um, and only a couple of people who are saying no, it definitely shouldn't be aligned. Okay, fantastic. If you wanna discuss your answers or alignment in more depth, please join the breakout group on alignment. So the next issue that we looked at in the guidance um, and in our review paper, the research was at cross-cutting themes that are often used alongside the criteria. 
In LNAP's original 2006 guidance, we had eight cross-cutting themes that you can see on the slide. Some of those reflected key concerns of the time. For instance, HIV AIDS, which is not frequently reflected in humanitarian evaluations today. Now the OECD DAC and their guidance has taken the approach of not explicitly including cross-cutting themes. It did add coherence um, as an additional criteria in 2019, and it's recently produced an additional paper um, on how inclusion and also human rights can be integrated across the criteria. Um, but the question that we have here um, for LNAP is, do we want to keep cross-cutting themes as LNAP did before in our updated guidance? And the second question, which I think is more of a polemical issue, is should we consider adding additional criteria? So just really briefly, I wanted to give you an example of some of the things that we looked at in the review paper. So like I said, we looked at um, recent humanitarian evaluations. And what we looked at was we looked at how some of these cross-cutting themes or themes were treated in a selection of humanitarian evaluations. In this case, it was a sample of 40. What you can see from the table is that gender equity and inclusion were often included or addressed in evaluations, particularly gender and inclusion. It was commonly addressed as a cross-cutting theme in the evaluations, but in some instances, gender or inclusion were added as their own criteria. In other cases, the evaluations address these issues under other existing DAC criteria or in another format. Um, so we've done this for most of the cross-cutting issues. And if you look at the paper, there was actually 40 different uh, themes that we looked at how they were addressed in a sample of evaluations. So you could say there's a little bit of anarchy now um, in how these themes are addressed and whether that's a good or a bad thing is one of the questions that we pose today. So we have a few breakout groups looking at some of these cross-cutting themes. Um, so as you saw from the previous slide, gender was one of the cross-cutting themes in our original guidance. There is now an increasing focus on inclusion and equity. So should those issues actually be addressed together? And as we saw from the previous slide, gender, diversity, inclusion, and equity are the most applied cross-cutting themes. Should this remain a cross-cutting theme? Or if not, how should these issues be addressed in the guidance? So this is your breakout option too, if you would like to join this group. Now we're gonna go to our mentee poll uh, once again. Um, so if you can very quickly go to menti.com, enter the code. We're gonna ask everyone, how should gender equity and inclusion be addressed in the updated guidance? And this is your last uh, mentee poll for the day. And then I'll go over the other breakout groups. Okay, um, so I don't see any responses coming through. Oh, oh suddenly <laughs> they popped up. Okay, great. So it looks fairly evenly divided between it should be a cross-cutting theme or it should be its own criteria. Great, so if you wanna join this, you'll go to breakout group number two to discuss. So the third breakout group is looking at environment and climate, which was again, another cross-cutting theme in the guidance. However, our review showed that in, um, looking at the environment was only common in 10% of the evaluations. It was not very frequent, despite the fact that there are greater calls to focus on climate action, environmental concerns, and the greening of humanitarian action. If you want to discuss this, you will join breakout group number three to look at should these issues be added as a cross-cutting theme, or if not, how can these concerns be included in the updated guidance? So moving right along, the next breakout group is looking at accountability to affected populations. In our original guide, participation of primary stakeholders was a cross-cutting theme. So accountability to affected populations, participation and communication with communities was the second most applied cross-cutting theme when we looked at the sample of evaluations. However, the review of the grand bargain and other research has suggested that despite efforts to improve participation and AAP, we have not yet seen any substantive impact. So there is a question of should more emphasis be placed on this in evaluations? Should it be explicitly addressed? Is it being adequately addressed? And how could it be included in the guidance? So if you'd like to join this discussion, it's one of the options in the breakout. 
Next, we looked at localization. Um, so localization was not a cross-cutting issue in our original guidance. What we did find, however, is that it's commonly addressed as a cross-cutting theme in humanitarian evaluations, and it actually is one of the ones that's more frequently added as an additional criterion, although commonly only by some organizations. Now, despite high-level policy commitments to localization, LNAP research suggests that there has been little progress. So the question is, should localization be explicitly included in the guidance? And if so, how? If you'd like to join the localization group, you will get a chance in a minute. Now I'm going to go to our sixth issue. Um, so this one goes to the existing criteria. So in LNAP's 2006 guide, connectedness replaced sustainability. It was felt that connectedness was a more appropriate criteria than sustainability in humanitarian context. Now our review, found that connectedness is actually the least used criterion humanitarian evaluations. Nevertheless, it was still used in 30% of the humanitarian evaluations. The other issue with connectedness is there is a wide variety of the ways that evaluations defined and looked at connectedness, which you can see on the slide. Sustainability was actually more used in humanitarian evaluations than connectedness. So if you want to discuss this, the question is, is it important to keep connectedness as a criteria in the updated guidance, or would it be better if it's either replaced or merged with sustainability? Okay, now that we have very rapidly gained a snapshot of some of the issues, we're going to go to our breakout groups for a chance to discuss further. You will now get to choose one of the six topics on the slide. So please take a minute to think around which group you would like to join. Before we go to the breakouts, I'm just gonna briefly explain the instructions for your breakout room. Um, so as I said, you will be asked to join one of the themes. Um, these will be added in the chat in just a minute, so please be watching the chat. Now, a facilitator has been assigned for each group. When you click on the link in the chat, you'll be taken to another room. It's gonna open in a Zoom meeting, which will allow you to see the other participants to unmute yourself and to speak. In the breakout groups, you're gonna have 35 minutes to discuss. A Miro board has been set up in each breakout group and the facilitator who's already assigned to your group will explain how to use the Miro. At the end of the 35 minutes, the facilitator will report back to plenary and each group will have two to three minutes to report back. Now, the important thing is that we would like you to return to plenary um, at 3.05 British summertime, which is basically five past the hour. So now, um, I don't know if you wanna go back to the slide with the breakout groups, so you can see the six options. Now you should see in the chat, the different breakout group options with the links that you can click on. So if you can please choose one of these links in the break, in the chat to go into the breakout. Okay, so if you all have the chat function open, you can click on topic one, alignment with the OECD DAT criteria. Topic two, gender equity and inclusion. Topic three, environment and climate. Topic four, accountability to affected populations. Topic five, localization. Or topic six, sustainability and connectedness. Now you will need to actively choose your breakout group by choosing from the options in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna just welcome everybody back to the plenary session. I hope that you had really rich discussions in your group. Now, today is obviously just the first of what we hope to be many events throughout a six month consultation period. I am gonna go to each facilitator who is gonna give feedback um, from your discussions, just a couple points. Each facilitator will have exactly two minutes to feedback. Of course, we also have the mirror boards from your group. 
and you can continue adding stickies to them or rearranging them if you'd like to. So in just a minute, I'm going to ask each facilitator, the facilitator of each group, to unmute themselves and to give feedback to us in two minutes of what were the key messages of the two questions that we asked for each group or a feedback of the discussion. So our first group was the group that was discussing how closely aligned should updated LNAP guidance be with the OECD DAC criteria. And so I'm gonna go over to the facilitator of the first group, John Mitchell, if you could just capture in two minutes the essence of the feedback that you had. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Susanna. I will capture this essence in less than two minutes, I think. But the fir first thing to say is it was interesting who turned up for the uh, this discussion. And there were, uh, uh, I think, quite a few older gentlemen, um, including who have been around in the evaluation world for many years. And we had very uh, pleased to have uh, Alistair Hallam, who I believe wrote the first ever uh, humanitarian guide to evaluation some years before the uh, ALNAP guide came out. So there's a tremendous amount of experience in our group, but I think it would be fair to say that perhaps we're, uh, collectively we're, that we're, we're more of a conservative group than, uh, than a radical group. Um, and I think the, the first point is that came across quite strongly is that the OECD DAC criteria uh, are not perfect and they do have their weaknesses and people made some uh, very interesting points about uh, uh, the uh, difficulty with in interpreting criteria and how sometimes confusing they can be and off-putting and dry and so on. But they do um, and I think th this came out as a, a as a general consensus. They do provide a very very useful foundation. So I think my first conclusion would be that this group thinks it would be foolish to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, let's keep them as a foundation, but let's not use let's not use it as a straitjacket. So the the second thing that came across I felt was that really building on that is that. Even though the 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 foundation um, uh, is, is, is because the foundation is so solid, we need to find more innovative and imaginative ways of contextualizing the uh, the issues. And if the second important point that came out of this discussion, I would say uh, that uh, the contextualization issue is is really really key. And so what we have is. An older group saying supporting the foundation of the OECD DAC criteria, uh, uh, consciously aware that they're not perfect, but nevertheless saying they're very, very useful. Let's not stray too far away from them. Let's make them more creative and imaginative, and let's get better at contextualizing. Thank you. Susanna, back to you. Great. Thank you so much, John. So we're going to go immediately to the feedback from our second group on gender equity and inclusion, and that's Mickey, um, the facilitator. Uh, Mickey, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Susanna. I think um, in our group, we had a very intimate group, so we had a lot of time for discussion, which was great. I think similar to John, actually, context seems to be key also in our group. There were uh, differing views on this topic, so there were some who thought that um, it it would be important to keep, them, uh, keep it as a cross-cutting theme, um, just because uh, there were, if having too many evaluation criteria would make it very difficult, um, would kind of weaken the scope of uh, terms of reference, um, uh, and you could actually lose the focus um, of what you're trying to research or trying to look at in the evaluation itself. I think then there was another group that was saying, well, actually, these, you know, these three topics are quite important, um, and they're slightly, they're very different, and each one has a weight. And so if you mix it all together, then it loses its value. And so it's important to separate it out. And there was quite an interesting mitigation for that saying, well, we could actually separate it out as criteria, but then reduce the evaluation questions and guidance could be provided on that, which I, I thought was an interesting mitigation. I mean, also was, the argument for that was because donors are also looking at this um, as these themes is very important. Um, that there also would be value to separating it out. But I think what, I, what, what the takeaway really was that, you know, clearly there needs to be a bit more reflection on this. I think um, we also talked about the terms themselves, that they could actually be interpreted in many different ways. Um, 
so it'd be good to kind of take a look at that and see, uh, and just food for thought really. Um, and that's kind of the overall grosso modo um, kind of feedback uh, on that. Over, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mickey. Um, we're gonna go to the third group on in <clears throat> environment and climate. Um, and I realized that I didn't present uh, Sarah earlier on. Um, so Sarah Garvey was the facilitator of this group and she is a new research fellow working on evaluation with us at LNAP and she will be leading the facilitation of some future consultation events. Sarah, do you wanna feed back to us in two minutes of the discussions in your group? Sarah, over to you. Thank you, Susanna. I'll keep my camera off because my connection is a bit unstable here in Tunis, in Tunisia. Uh, we also had an intimate but very good group with uh, very good discussions on environment and climate. Uh, we agreed in the group that the issues of environment and climate generally are under-prioritized in the humanitarian sector and in humanitarian interventions, um, and that there are a bunch of obstacles that would need to be removed for the um, issues to be more prioritized. There are funding issues, there are awareness issues, there's a lack of tools around how to mainstream environment and climate into humanitarian intervention. Um, and uh, lastly, there also needs to be a shift in humanitarian mindset in order for environment and climate to be more uh, prioritized because traditionally uh, the humanitarian sector has a tendency to uh, focus rightly on saving lives, which means that issues uh, related to environment and climate are deprioritized and uh, maybe are not put so high up on the agenda. Um, the group agreed that uh, environment and climate, uh, for reasons we should all be familiar with, should be higher on the agenda. And we, the, the majority of the group, therefore, proposed to have it as a separate criteria uh, to kind of put the spotlight on the issue and kind of contribute to, uh, to promoting uh, the issues uh, on a sector-wide level. Uh, so that was the feedback from my group. Thank you. Over to you, Susanna. Okay, great. So it looks like new criteria was the option that that group went with. <clears throat> um, so now to accountability for affected populations, and that was uh, Michele from UNICEF. Um, if you can feed back from the discussions in your group. Michele, over to you. Uh, thanks. Uh, when, with many thanks to the uh, colleagues who were part of the group. So two key messages. No, it's not being used, uh, not systematically. And the second message, yes, we would like to have it, but rather as a cross-cutting thing. So uh, maybe you know, a little bit more on each of the two responses. It's not being used, it's not a criterion, just because it's not a criterion, it's not being used because of this dogmatic and by default way of doing evaluation. There's not enough budget and time, even when questions related to AP are included in terms of reference. To so some people, you know, some colleagues, you know, AP sounds like more uh, project management activity. And some, some of the colleagues were saying, uh, it's probably better to monitor AEP throughout the implementation of a response, let's say a humanitarian response, rather than having the evaluator at the very end, because uh, uh, the risk become the risk is that we become redundant when it's too late. On the other hand, um, in terms of perspective uh, for the future, um, there's a possibility to um, keep it as a as a cross-cutting theme. It's more of a mindset, it's a prism through which we could understand reality and also through which we could also debate on the criteria itself. Uh, some people, uh, some of the colleagues were saying it's also a process. So you may want to integrate AEP in the way you conduct yourself as an evaluator when you discuss the questions, the criteria, with the clients, but also the people on the ground. And last but not least, if we look at the UN definition for accountability to affected population, it's very much about the individuals. Do the individuals have access to feedback mechanisms? Are there complaints being acted upon, et cetera? But sometimes there's not sufficient weight on to what extent the organizations themselves, and we're talking about more the normative aspect, institutional aspect, uh, really walk in the talk in the way they deal with donors. They deal with you know people on the ground, uh, the way their staff is responsible, not so accountable in the end to the affected population. So lots of interesting debates, not much time, but it was very intriguing and very enriching. Thanks. Great. So I think we're seeing very quickly that a lot of these issues go beyond evaluation themselves and look at how we judge the performance of humanitarian action in general. 
and what are the criteria that we would say um, humanitarian action is successful. <clears throat> so our next facilitator, um, she is the author of our Student Humanitarian System Report and so has looked at these issues of system-wide performance, including localization. Um, and we're, LNAP is doing future work on this, but I'm gonna hand over to Alice, the head of research at LNAP, to feedback um, in two minutes max on the discussion on localization. Alice, over to you. Great, thank you, Susanna. Very much a tall order, it's a very active, lively discussion, but a lot of similar themes to what you've heard so far. So I think the resounding answer is that yes, localization should be in the guidance. But there, there are big questions as to how. So I think more of the consensus, if you can call it that, was around cross-cutting. Um, but there's a lot of big questions that were raised in particular around definitions, feeling that the definition of localization is still unclear and needs to be heavily contextualized when applied. At the same time, people felt it's a really important issue. You know, we're continuing to see how the system is failing to shift power. And so this could be a very critical issue for evaluations to look at um, in more detail. I think two other uh, key themes that came out of the discussions, one is really the role of evaluation specifically versus research or other mechanisms for monitoring progress on localization. So a lot of people brought up other initiatives like the Grand Bargain, like the Charter for Change, like CHS. And someone mentioned, a couple of people mentioned having KPIs on localization. Now, how does evaluation complement or connect to those other separate types of efforts around monitoring um, uh, performance and holding actors to account? And then a final thought that's really critical is, is that localization is not just about what we look at, but also how we conduct evaluation ourselves. And so I'll leave you with the comment from one of our participants who put this really nicely saying, so if evaluating localization is about assessing who owns the humanitarian response, then does that not also go for the evaluation itself? Who owns the evaluations? Thank you. Sure, yes. Um, getting into some meaty questions here that I'm sure we can discuss uh, further. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to the facilitator of the last group on sustainability or connectedness. I don't know if you have such a clear cut answer of should we use both or one of them or merge them. Um, but Henri, over to you of UNHCR. Henri. Thanks, Susanna. So um, we started off in the uh, with the group to discuss a little bit. So to unpack a little bit, what is the difference between the two concepts? And so out of that was um, uh, that the scope of between sustainability and uh, connectedness is slightly different in that connectedness is focused more on the on the well interconnectedness between actors between sectors between different phases of a response whereas sustainability is more um, uh, emphasizing longer term viability and links also to environmental um, aspects um, <clears throat> as well as social and economic aspects of an intervention excuse me <clears throat> So with that uh, discussion ensued, and I think the key takeaways are that there's quite a clear consensus that connectedness should stay. Um, some of the reasons provided for this is that sustainability was not seen as, a, as an appropriate um, uh, criteria for humanitarian action because humanitarian action by design uh, is not sustainable. Um, there was some discussion about uh, the fact that we need to think about um, um, more meaningful, we need to think about meaningful action in humanitarian crises, uh, as well as prolonged crises and how we connect these to uh, transitional contexts. So the issue uh, and theme that came out was the humanitarian peace development and peace nexus. And that connectedness provides a very good entry point because it looks at the relationships between actors. It looks at sort of the relationship between different phases of a response. Uh, and so that that Criteria in itself is very important for for the age, for the humanitarian development uh, and peace nexus. Um, there was some discussion around flexibility also, uh, so there was sort of uh, a consensus that we should be flexible um, uh, and that both criteria are useful, but that you know we need to think more about how we apply um, our connectedness to the work that we do. Um, so there was mention of the fact that you know whether there's too many criteria for people to, you know, to usefully uh, apply and that there are so many interlinkages between the different criteria that we need, that remaining, that maintaining that flexibility is really important. 
Um, there was a, a question and a general interest as to why connectedness was one of the least used criteria in humanitarian evaluations, or at least the sample that we looked at, because it just it seems to be such an important one for the work that we do, which brings me to the last point um, related also to uh, the issue of uh, local ownership or localization. Uh, and there was a discussion on whether um, that fits better within a uh, uh, other criteria or whether it should find a home within connectedness as well, because connectedness is primarily or um, preoccupied with the relationships between different actors uh, uh, and phases of, of, of a response. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I'm sorry if I butchered the, uh, the, the breakout group, uh, but thanks. Great. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, interconnectedness um, between all of the different themes, the cross-cutting issues and the criteria. So we will be using the Miro boards. Um, we'll take a good look at them. We'll try to share them as well. And this is really just the first of a discussion um, that we'll be having. Now we know that there was definitely not time to cover all of the issues today. Like I said, we only presented a small bit of the research itself, but we really wanna keep this conversation going. Um, so I'm gonna go now to the next slide. How do we keep this conversation going? Um, so as I said, today was the first step. Um, this is more of a journey. So over the next six months, we have a process and we want to work with all of you. And we want your feedback on how best to do that. So the first, obviously, is that today is the launch of our global survey. We want you to take the survey and to share it widely. Um, there is a hashtag, um, which you should see on the screen, share the guidance that you can use. You also see the link and you see the QR code. We'll be sending up follow-up communications. If you can please share them with your colleagues, both m and &E practitioners, but also users of humanitarian evaluation. If you can help make sure that people take the survey so we can reach a good number um, of have a more representative survey, that would be fantastic. So the second action obviously is the research that we've undertaken. There is a longer research paper and also a shorter summary of the paper. Um, we have just published it. You can use the link and the QR code to go to the research. It also gives you the background of why certain issues were collected, um, chosen for the survey. Um, once again, on the survey, you have open questions, but you also have quite targeted questions. And a lot of the issues that we've discussed today are also addressed in the survey. Um, so please do read the paper. And then finally, um, and this should hopefully be a link in the chat, we've created a website to host all of the consultations so you can have one spot to go to to get all of the information. We are going to be hosting a number of different types of consultation events over the next six months. Um, so there are two that are already uh, available and announced now. Um, so in two days time, we will be joining the Canadian Evaluation Association's International Day. This is online. It's open to anyone to register. They have a really good lineup. So not only our session, but a number of other sessions that day. So you should see the link in the chat if you would like to join the International Day of the Canadian Evaluation Association. They're also gonna have sessions in other languages. Um, so please do register for that to continue this conversation. Um, the second event is that on the 4th of July, my colleague, Sarah, um, we'll be holding a session at the Forum International Francophone de l'Evaluation. So this will be held in person at their conference. So if you're going to attend that conference, it will be held in French, make sure to check out our session. There's going to be a number of other events, um, which we will be announcing on the website. This includes upcoming events in the MENA region, but also events in Asia and Pacific, and at other evaluation conferences and workshops. Um, so there's many other ways to engage. And I think that's the key message that I wanna leave you with today. So we also would encourage you, if you have a suggestion of you would like to do a different type of consultation, you would like to talk about something different or we're missing the key issues here, do you reach out to us. We would love for you to suggest a, a consultation to help organize or to help facilitate it. So this includes if you would like to organize a specific consultation event within your organization. Those of you who have a lot of ME colleagues, please do invite us and we can do something together to get the feedback of your colleagues. And as some people also said, the users of the evaluations themselves. We're also having um, a call for blogs on our website. If you have views on the criteria, 
we would love for you to contact us and we can send you the guidelines on the blogs. You can also find the blog guidelines on our website. But we want to start a debate on the criteria that we'll be continuing over the next six months. And then finally, if you have any other ideas, any other um, proposals, please do reach out to us. Um, so we have a website, which you can see on the screen. Um, it's a val criteria at lnap.org. So this is shared with myself, but also my other colleagues. And we'll also be discussing with the advisory group on the different options that we have going forward for further consultation events. So once again, please do visit our website um, for the updates. We're gonna be sending you some follow-up communication. We'll be sharing the recording. We'll be sharing the Miro boards. And we'll be sharing all the links because I know that we've run through so much today in a very uh, fast and condensed 90 minutes. Um, but I just wanna give one more thank you to all of the facilitators um, and also to all of the participants today. And once again, really do reach out to us right at this, at this link. Um, join us if you'd like for two days in our next session and keep checking in. And we hope to hear from you in our future consultation events as well. Um, so thank you once again, everyone. Um, and yes, I give you back two minutes of your time. We've actually ended two minutes early today, which I think is a first for me um, in most of the webinars that I've done. Thank you.